Hello, my name is Sam Ord. I'm an intensive care specialist at Nepean Hospital in Sydney. And during this presentation, I'd like to take you through how to perform a full comprehensive transthoracic echocardiography study. And I'm gonna use an echo simulator, Bob here, to try and uh, demonstrate that. During this presentation, it is dependent on the fact that you do know how to do a focus study and you've got some idea about how to use some of the Doppler uh, profiles. And that's gonna include color Doppler, continuous wave Doppler, pulsed wave Doppler, and tissue Doppler. And some of those are explained in other videos that are on our website. So let's get started. So the first image you're going to be taking is your parasternal long axis view with the uh, right ventricle at the top, the left ventricle, and the left atrium underneath. And you've uh, got to make sure that you are on axis as we take this picture, and that you're not sliding off to one side or the other of the left ventricle. Uh, you're going to start by getting a, a color wave Doppler, putting it over your aortic valve after you've taken your 2D picture uh, to see if there are any significant regurgitation or turbulent blood flow. You're then going to move that color box down onto the mitral valve to see if you've got, again, any regurgitation going into the left atrium or turbulent blood flow suggesting stenosis. We can then fan down by tilting our probe, pointing it down more towards the patient's right hip, and we can here see the RV inflow view, where you've got the tricuspid valve at the top, and um, where you've got the tricuspid valve in the middle, excuse me, the right ventricle at the top, and the right atrium underneath. And again, with the color box, you can put it over the tricuspid valve to get an idea if you've got any regurgitation flow. Just going to take off the uh, bone so that you can see the angle that we're, uh, the angle that's changed from coming from the parasternal long axis view. As we fan down, we're pointing more towards the right hip now, and now we're looking through the right ventricle, the RV inflow view. So that's the difference from the parasternal long axis view down to the tricuspid view, or the RV inflow view. I'll show you what a normal, uh, a normal trace is meant to look like here. And again, this is just a trace of tricuspid regurgitation. And one of the things I want you to start to have a, a, an idea of is when we're using uh, color Doppler, we use it to direct our, uh, our cursor so that we can put it through the, the continuous wave um, cursor is through the area where we suspect there to be the most tricuspid regurgitation. So we're using the color wave uh, the color Doppler box to guide our continuous wave Doppler interrogation profile. After that, we're then going to go and we're going to tilt our probe up. So coming from our parasternal long axis view, we can then tilt our probe up to start to bring in the tricuspid valve. And here we can start to bring in our pulmonary valve, excuse me. And you see the difference coming from our parasternal long axis view, tilting up to bring in our uh, uh, main pulmonary artery, which splits into our left and right pulmonary trunk. And we can use this, and I'll show it on this one. And here we can see an example, in, uh, a, a example of a normal patient. And in our top right picture, you can see the color profile going through the pulmonary artery. You can just get a suggestion there of the pulmonary valve that's sitting there in the middle of the screen. In the bottom left, this is with continuous wave Doppler, and we see that because we have a filled out uh, profile there. And in the bottom right of the screen here, we've got our um, pulsed wave Doppler, where we're putting our um, marker about one centimeter before the pulmonary valve. And here we've got uh, the pulsed wave Doppler profile, where we've got uh, the, just the outside of the profile shown, and it's dark in the middle. So that would conclude our parasternal long axis views. After that, taking our right hand, we are going to rotate 90 degrees, and we'll start at the level of the aortic valve. And here at the, uh, at the aortic valve level in a short axis view, we have the aortic valve in the middle. We have our left atrium, interatrial septum, right atrium, tricuspid valve, right ventricle, flowing round into the pulmonary valve here. We can use our 2D to get an idea of whether there is 
reasonable opening of the aortic valve if it's horribly sclerotic. We can get an idea if there's any abnormal uh, right ventricle free wall motion, uh, obvious abnormalities to the tricuspid valve, for example. We can then go on to use our color wave Doppler to interrogate both the aortic valve, seeing if there's any obvious regurgitation during diastole or whether there's obvious turbulent blood flow, again, suggesting stenosis. We can use our color box to come over our pulmonary valve, see if there's any obvious regurgitation. We can then use our color box to come over the tricuspid valve to, again, see if there's any horrible regurgitation. Again, using the color box to help guide us, we can then use our continuous wave, uh, continuous wave um, uh, cursor to guide us to, to see if there's any obvious tricuspid regurgitation. And we can use the same thing using our color wave box to look over the pulmonary valve. So we can put our cursor down through the pulmonary valve trying to optimize our Doppler angle. Again, I'll show you some pictures here of what it can look like in short axis. So using our color box over the pulmonary artery here, we can see what we've got, normal laminar blood flow here, and no obvious regurgitation. We can use our continuous wave Doppler profile to get an idea if there is any obvious regurgitation coming through in, during diastole and see if there's any increased flows during systole. With the pulsed wave Doppler box, again, one centimeter behind the pulmonary valve, we can get our pulsed wave Doppler profile. And again, the importance is to try and analyze these valves from all available angles, trying to get the, the most information that we possibly can. Because sometimes one echo window is not going to be perfect. And so we're going to try and use the, the most available information that we have. So after we've finished with looking at the short axis view at the level of the aortic valve, we can then fan down through from the aortic valve level you can see as we fan down through to the base of the heart at the mitral valve level with the anterior wall, the inferior wall, anteroceptal, infraceptal, anterolateral, infralateral, down to the mid-papillary level where you can see the papillary muscles and right the way down to the apex of the heart. So just one more time, we go from the aortic valve level fan down to the mitral valve level or the base of the left ventricle, to the mid-ventricle level or the papillary muscle view, and down to the apex. And we know it's the apex because we lose the papillary muscles. OK. Now we're going to move on to the apical views. So you're going that marker pointing down towards the uh, bed. We try and find our apical view with the left ventricle, the right ventricle, the right atrium, and the left atrium. And here we have the mitral valve, and here's the tricuspid valve. We're going to try and assess valvular function, systolic function, diastolic function of both the left and the right ventricle. Okay? So we can start off by here just having a subjective assessment of left ventricle size and function the same for the atria. Uh, next thing, again, with color wave Doppler, we can place our color wave box over the mitral valve. And you'll notice how I'm trying to keep this uh, color wave box as small and uh, focused on the areas that I'm really interested in. The bigger you make that box, the more impairment you're going to have in things like your frame rate, and uh, that will impair your temporal resolution. So you want to try and keep your uh, color wave boxes as uh, small and as focused as possible. And here I'm going to be looking for stenosis, so if I've got abnormal blood flow, and again, after assessing for the 2D, for the, the way that mitral valve looks, and I can move that box down. If I want to assess for regurgitation that's coming here into the left atrium. If I think there's some regurgitation presence there, I can put a continuous wave profile Doppler, uh, Doppler through that uh, mitral valve leaflet tips, and you can assess for mitral regurgitation. If I want to assess for diastolic flow or the mitral inflow pattern, I can use my pulsed wave Doppler profile at the tips of the mitral valve leaflets. And I'll show you some examples of these here. 
So here you can see this color wave box here. I'm actually covering both the uh, left ventricle and the uh, left atrium here. And here you've got the continuous wave Doppler profile trace looking down through that mitral valve, which will give you a suggestion if there is any tricuspid regurgitation during systole, which is from the beginning of the QRS complex to the end of the T wave. And over here, this is with pulsed wave Doppler at the tips of the mitral valve leaflets. And here we've got the E wave, or the early filling of the left ventricle, uh, the E wave and the A wave for atrial kick. So the E and the A wave here happening during diastole. One of the things I'm going to ask you to notice about, particularly with uh, both the continuous and the pulse wave Doppler profiles, is how I'm trying to optimize the image here. So that I'm trying to make what I'm interested in filling the screen. I only have about three cardiac cycles uh, uh, across one, uh, one profile or one screen when, I'm, when a patient's in sinus rhythm and maybe five when a patient's in atrial fibrillation. And I try and take an average of all the values. So again, three values for sinus rhythm, five values for atrial fibrillation. The scale is optimized, the baseline is down, and the gain is not too high and not too low. So I'm, I'm trying to look at the modal velocity or where the majority of the blood flow is, is flowing rather than over gaining or under gaining a picture. So it's just the same as if you were going to try and optimize a standard 2D picture by optimizing your depth and your focus position and your frequency and your sector width and things like that. I do exactly the same thing with my Doppler, pro uh, Doppler profile, trying to optimize the baseline, trying to optimize the scale, trying to optimize the gain. And all of this means that I can make the most accurate measurements possible. Okay. So the next part of uh, the comprehensive study is going to look at the tissue Doppler imaging. So uh, tissue Doppler imaging, we're going to ignore the fast moving blood and we're just going to focus on the slower moving tissue. Again, angle dependent, just the same as all, Doppler, uh, as all Doppler is. So we've got to try and make sure here, if we're trying to assess the movement of the lateral annulus of the mitral valve leaflet towards the apex, we try and make sure that we've got that, uh, the interventricle septum right down the middle of the screen. And we're trying to definitely assess the movement from the annulus towards the apex. Okay? And then the same for the mitral valve. So over here you can see that I'm assessing, I've got the nice angle between where the medial mitral annulus is towards the apex. And this is what it can look like. So here again using our color Doppler uh, to try and optimize our, uh, our uh, angle of the pulsed wave Doppler so that it's at the tip of the mitral valve leaflets for the gate and we're in the direction of where the blood flow is going. Let's not forget that sometimes with a dilated cardiomyopathy, the blood flow can become more circumferential or more lateral. And so sometimes you have to move the, the probe over a little bit to optimize your Doppler angle. Not in this case, though. So we've got a good Doppler angle. We've got a nice trace at the tips of the mitral valve leaflets for the E and the A wave. And here at the bottom on the left here is our uh, tissue Doppler imaging for your medial mitral annulus. And over here it's your lateral mitral annulus. And we're looking at the E prime. And you can look at the A prime as well if you'd like to. But mainly we're just looking at the E prime, trying to get an estimate of things like the E wave over the E prime ratio, which can give us an estimate of what left atrial pressures are, for example. Again, please note that I've optimized my scale, so what I'm interested in fills the screen. My uh, baseline is uh, in the right position, and the scale is optimized so that uh, I can try and make the most accurate measurements possible for both the medial and the lateral annulus. As a quick aside, please note that the medial uh, E prime is always less than the lateral E prime and the one disease process that maybe that doesn't happen in this constricted pericarditis where we can see the reversal of that called annulus reversus. Okay. So after we've looked for mitral regurgitation, we've looked for uh, the inflow into the uh, left ventricle, we've looked at our tissue Doppler. The next we can look for is to go and have a look at our left ventricle outflow tract and the aortic valve flows. So to do that we need to have a look at our five chamber view. So here you can see in the four chamber view and if I then tilt the probe up, in comes to view the left ventricle outflow tract and the aortic valve. Four chamber, a little bit of a tilt up and we get in our five chamber. And what I'm going to ask you to have a look at now is as I put this color wave box on, can you get a sense that the flow 
if I were to put my continuous wave Doppler sort of angle right down through it, I'm not going to be optimizing the angle for where that blood flow is. I think that the blood flow is slightly more uh, tangential to this. So what I try and do to optimize my angle is I'm going to tilt my probe so the left ventricle outflow tract comes over towards the left side of the screen. And now you can see that my Doppler angle is much, much more optimized. And that means that I'm not going to underestimate the flows that are going through that area. I'm going to start off with uh, a pulse wave Doppler profile, again with the gate just behind that uh, uh, aortic valve. And at that point there, we can start measuring what the left ventricle outflow tract flow is. After that, I'm going to look with my continuous wave Doppler profile trace coming down through there, looking at the flows all the way along that line. And normally, the most, uh, the fastest moving area is usually the aortic valve. And this can be where we can start assessing aortic valve stenosis. Notable abnormalities are if you've got any kind of interventricular obstruction or if you've got any kind of LVOT uh, obstruction or membrane there, for example, uh, then sometimes the highest flow along that line is not the aortic valve. And again, these are some of the things that we have to look at when we're assessing for, uh, assessing for those diseases. So this is what it may look like. So up here, you can see the, uh, the color wave box in the top left here going through the aortic valve. Here, I'm using my continuous wave Doppler profile. I've tried to optimize my angle using the color wave box to guide where I'm putting that continuous wave Doppler uh, uh, line. And we can measure the VTI, the mean gradients, the max gradients, et cetera, down through the aortic valve, which you can see here as a normal, nice flow, uh, and it's during systole. Under it, I've got two profiles here for the left ventricle outflow tract profile. What I'm going to ask you to note is, can you see the closing click that's in here? This is really important, because if we're going to use this to try and measure things like stroke volume, uh, we want to make sure that where we've measured our uh, left ventricle outflow tract to diameter in our Paris Dunn long axis view, it matches to where we're putting the pulsed wave Doppler gate in our pulse wave Doppler profile in our five chamber view. I hope that makes sense. So that's the way we can make sure we're measuring the two in the same area. So here I've got my left ventricle outflow tract, I've got my closing click, I feel like I'm in the right spot for that, I can make my measurements. And I make between three to five measurements to try and make sure that we're uh, making uh, a nice average. Again, the Doppler uh, profile is optimized. The baseline's up at the top. The scale's reduced. So what I'm interested in is filling the screen. My gain is turned down, so I'm looking at the modal velocity. So obviously, you're hearing me repeat myself again and again, because I'm doing the same thing every single time I'm doing any kind of Doppler measurement, is to try and make sure I'm doing the most accurate I can, and I'm averaging all the results. OK. So after the five chamber view, we can go back to our uh, we can go back to our uh, four chamber view, and maybe before we just completely leave the left ventricle, I'm just going to add in one extra thing here, which is which is a little uh, which is a little bit tricky, and uh, this you're not going to be able to get it with every single patient, but I do find it a really useful. Um, a useful thing to try and do, which is looking at the pulmonary valve flows. Now, this can be useful if we think that we've got raised left ventricle endodiastolic pressures uh, or left atrial pressures, or if we have significant mitral regurgitation. What I'm looking for here is the pulmonary vein that's coming here into the left atrium. Okay, I've got to change a few parameters for this one. Okay, so first of all, with the color box that I put over this, I'll often try and change my scale so that I'm looking at low flows. Here I've got, I'm looking at quite high, uh, high flows, but often we're looking at flows that are maybe closer to around about, say, 20 to 40 centimeters movement. So I might change down the scale here. The next is with my pulse wave Doppler box, I try and get it about a centimeter back into that pulmonary vein. And sometimes increasing the, uh, the gate can help. And sometimes even decreasing the gate can help, depending. Uh, I'd start with increasing the gate first of all. And the profile you're trying to see is something that looks like this. So here we have the uh, profile of a pulsed wave Doppler. One of the things I'm really trying to avoid here is looking at the Nyqu uh, avoiding the getting any, any kind of aliasing that goes on if we've gone over the Nyquist limit. And so I've got to make sure that the depth is reduced as much as I can. Sometimes I reduce the sector width even further. 
And here I've got that pulse wave Doppler box that's sitting right into that pulmonary vein. And we look here and we've got the S wave during systole from the beginning of the QRS to the end of the T wave. That's the S wave there, followed by the D wave underneath, and then just a little A wave reversal in there during atrial contraction during the P wave. So the S wave is usually greater than the D wave. Is the F wave is the, if the S wave is the same size as the D wave, that suggests that we've got some form of mildly raised left atrial pressure. If the S wave is smaller than the D wave, that suggests that we've got significantly raised left atrial pressure. And even if you see systolic reversal sometimes, that's uh, normally seen if you've got significant, so at least moderate or severe mitral regurgitation. Okay, so again, it's just a, a useful tool that you can pick up, particularly for looking for significant mitral regurgitation, especially if it's something like eccentric in origin. This can be useful for helping trying to see if there's significantly uh, raised left atrial pressures or mitral regurg. Okay. So after we've done this, we can now start looking at the, the right ventricle. So for the right ventricle, again, keeping that interventricle septum in the center of our image, we can start looking at the RV free wall, getting a, both a subjective assessment of RV size and RV function. We can use our 2D to look at the tricuspid valve, and we've got an abnormal morphology, and we can look at the size of the right atrium. Let's not forget that we've got our interatrial septum that's sitting in here, and if it's bowed to one way or bowed to the other, suggesting uh, raised atrial pressures. And again, it's just using all those tips and clues that you possibly can. Okay, so maybe the first one that we'd use that we, that we all know and use as part of every single focus study is the TAPSI. So we can slide our M mode through that lateral annulus of the tricuspid valve there, and we can get an idea of what our TAPSI is from there, or the tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. And that's the movement of that lateral annulus towards the apex of the, uh, of the uh, heart. So you've got to try and, again, it's angle dependent. Try and make sure that your angle is as best as you possibly can. After that, we can use our color wave box to, to look for tricuspid regurgitation. And again, well, sometimes uh, you're going to be able to see that this tricuspid regurgitation is sometimes not in exactly the plane that we'd have if we were to put our continuous wave Doppler uh, right through that tricuspid valve. Sometimes the tricuspid regurgitation is a bit more eccentric. This can be where it's useful to try and optimize our Doppler angle by sometimes using some off-axis imaging. So I'll just show you what I mean by that here. I'm going to put the bones back on. Okay, if you can imagine now that there may be the tricuspid regurgitation is pointing more sort of in that direction, one of the things that I can do is I can slide my probe round, so I'm moving it medially. So I've gone from my standard four-chamber view, and I'm just going to slide it round in that rib space. So I'm now off-axis for a standard apical four-chamber view, but I'm in a great view now for having a look down through that tricuspid valve. And I'll show you some examples of this over here. Um, so here we can see in the, uh, using the color box in this top right picture to see if there's a little trace of regurgitation. This is using our standard, uh, standard continuous wave Doppler angle from our sort of true apical four chamber view. And I can't see a lot of tricuspid regurg. But when I slide that probe around a little bit, so I'm now off axis, and you'll see that because look at, if, if you can see the difference in where that interventricle septum is, it's now much more over to the right of the picture. I've, got my, I've optimized my Doppler angle, and here I can see that tricuspid regurg much better. Again, baseline is in the right position. The scale is down, so what I'm interested in is filling that screen. There's only three cardiac cycles on there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. OK. After the tricuspid regurgitation, We can use our tissue Doppler, as well as looking at tissue Doppler in the lateral and medial mitral annulus. We can also look at it in our lateral annulus uh, of the tricuspid valve and give us another idea of maybe some systolic function. Again, it's Doppler dependent, so I try and keep that septum in the middle of the screen. I optimize as best I can. I'm trying to look at how fast that annulus is moving towards the uh, apex of the heart. And it can look something like this. 
So as well as you can see here, the tap C in the top right picture, down here in the bottom left image here, I'm trying to optimize my angle. I'm using the tissue Doppler imaging, uh, looking at the speed of what we call the S wave. And here's the systolic motion of that lateral annulus towards the apex. And here you can get an idea that we've got a velocity here of about uh, 11 or 12. OK. So after we've done the four-chamber view and interrogated the valves that we can see, both the, the mitral, the aortic, and the tricuspid, I'd now want to move around and look at the two-chamber view. So instead of having the septum right in the middle of the screen, trying to get me a nice uh, apical four-chamber view, I tilt it around a little bit. I might just get rid of the bones here. So a nice apical four-chamber view down what I call the gun barrel of that ventricle. I'm going to tilt my probe over so that now that the so main axis is no longer on the interventricle septum, it's now down the LV. And that means that when I rotate my probe, whatever's in the middle of the screen in one view will stay in the middle of the screen in another view. And I'm going to rotate it about 60 degrees, trying to keep everything as it is. And when I've come around 60 degrees, try and step down off that rib, I get my apical two-chamber view with my inferior wall here and my anterior wall here. Again, you can use the color wave Doppler box here to have a look to see if you've got any regurgitation coming into that left atrium. After you've looked at your two-chamber view, I can rotate another 60 degrees. Try and get off that rib. And here we get an idea of our left ventricle, mitral valve, left atrium, and here's the three-chamber view coming down through the LVOT and through that aortic valve. And if I add the bones back on, what you're going to notice is as well as called the three-chamber view, it's also known as the apical long axis view because we're kind of in the same angle as we'd be in if we were doing our parasternal long axis view. So hence the three-chamber view of the apical view is pretty much just the parasternal long axis view on a different angle. Yep. And again, we can use our color wave Doppler box here to have a look at the mitral regurgitation, if there's any abnormal blood flow there. But also, probably the most importantly, is it gives us a, another great look at the aortic valve. And so don't forget, if you're looking at aortic valve stenosis, you don't just use the apical five-chamber view, you also use the apical three-chamber view to try and give you the, the most information possible. OK, to finish up, I'm going to look at our subcostal view. So that's with a marker pointing towards the patient's left, our hand on top of the probe this time, and we can come up from underneath the ziffy sternum, and we can look at our uh, four-chamber view from underneath. Okay? And again, we can use our color wave box, Doppler box to have a look at our tricuspid valve, our mitral valve, maybe aortic regurgitation. And the last thing that we might be able to look at is when we're looking at our IVC, is we can look at our hepatic vein up here. So similar to the pulmonary veins looking for significantly raised left atrial pressure, we can use our hepatic vein here if we can try and optimize the angle as best we can. And we can use that to try and interrogate our hepatic vein from here to look at right atrial pressure or if there is significant tricuspid regurgitation. And it looks something like this. So here we get an idea of the color box down through our hepatic vein. We'll try and optimize our Doppler angle as much as we can. And here we have the S wave that is different, the pointing in a different direction from the uh, pulmonary vein, but the S wave is below, D wave, and then a little atrial kick above there. And notice the respiratory variation that goes on from there. And that's it. So a standard comprehensive transthoracic study can take anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes. It does take a, a, a degree of knowledge in uh, basic echo before you can go and attempt into it. I'm going to estimate that maybe it takes about 50 to 75 studies to start to try and get the hang of using Doppler. So don't be disheartened if you don't get it straight away. It does take considerable learning and I'd always encourage to try and find a mentor to help you go through this to teach you good tips and tricks and sonographers are a gold mine of information so I encourage you to use them. Thank you very much. I hope that was useful. Thank you.